come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Hear international presenter Gordon Gossett and travel with him to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. I want to welcome you in the audience and those that are watching on screen to our series called Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. This is a series of audiovisual presentations where we look at ancient texts, we look at archaeology, we look at university history, and we see that some very ancient mysteries can reveal a very real future for us here today. In fact, these mysteries will reveal your future. Good evening, folks. Good to see you here again with us. It's a privilege to be here with you again and to be able to continue our series on Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. Tonight, we're doing the first part of a two-part series, Patmos and the Lost City in the Sea. We're looking at the curse of the, the forbidden prophecy. The curse of the forbidden prophecy. Part one is called Decoding the Da Vinci Code. Decoding the Da Vinci Code. I doubt that there's a person in the room that hasn't heard of the book The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. Do you know the origin? I want to share with you the evolution of that book. It's not a, really a Dan Brown original. Is anybody familiar with this symbol over to the left of the screen? It's the symbol of the Priory of Sion, which is the whole Da Vinci Code book is based around this Priory of Sion, which apparently came in and was established way back 1,300 years ago. I want to tell you the truth about where that came from. It, it was established in 1956. 1956. By this man here, Pierre Plantin de saint Clair. Now this man had an identity crisis. You're going to see as we go through this introduction here that he had many names, many pseudonyms. He and, and a company with a man called André Bonholm, they created the Priory of Sion. And André was the president and Pierre was the grand treasurer. And this Priory of Sion apparently, according to them, was an ancient, ancient organisation with a specific purpose and a very unique and secretive history. I won't tell you the name in French, but in French, it's, a, it's an acronym. If you read the name of this organization in French, it's an acronym. But I'm going to put it on the screen in English, the translation into English. It is the... Oh, sorry, there it is in, it is in French. Forgive me, it's in French, and I'm not going to try and pronounce that. Even though I've got a French name, my ancestors were French, my uh, Francais is not so bon. But in English, it's the chivalry of Catholic rules and institutions of independent and traditionalist union. What was the purpose of the Priory of Sion? The, pr the purpose was, and this is, this is the myth orchestrated uh, by Pierre and André, that Delbert II was assassinated in the 7th century. And he was the last of the Merovingian kings, which was the lineage of kings in France, what we now know to be France. Part of the legend and myth that they created was that Sigebert IV, his son, either in reality or mythical, nobody really knows whether Sigebert was a real person or not, but he was found alive. So the end of the Merovingian kings did not end. The lineage didn't end with, with the assassination. But it continued to this day in the secrets of the Priory of Sion. And have a guess who might have been the last in that lineage to 
inherit the monarchy of France. It was Pierre. The thing was a hoax. It was orchestrated. And he was also known as the Chiren. Chiren. Where does that name come from? We read that it, we, the purpose of this, um, this priory, it was devoted to installing the great monarch of the Merovingian kingship, prophesied by, here's our friend Nostradamus back. Very, a lot of intrigue going on here. So this was devoted to installing the great monarch prophesied by Nostradamus to the throne of France. That was Pierre. And Chiren was a reference to Chiren Selene, which is, was Nostradamus's anagram of the name for this eschatological figure. Intriguing, isn't it? These men could come up with such a story. But who's going to believe a story like that? You need some, some backup, don't you, when you're creating a story? So they came up with some forgeries. The first forgery was by a friend of Pierre's. His name was Philippe Louis Henri Marie de, Ch de Ch Chissere. Chirisse. His name was, um, he was the ninth Marquis of Chirisse. He forged some documents that were smuggled in, some old parchments. They were smuggled in to the archives of the National Library of France. First forgery. And Gerard de Sade, also a friend of Pierre's, he wrote a book based on those documents. In fact, he wrote two books and translated it into English. The title is The Gold of Rain of the Strange Life of Beringa Sunier, Priest of Rain Le Chateau. That was in 1967. In 1968, the book was published in a, a, a paperback form under this title, The Accursed Treasure of René Le Chateau, 1968. Jump forward a few years, and a man by the name of Henry Lincoln, who worked with the BBC, he read The Accursed Treasure. And he was so intrigued, he convinced the BBC to run three documentaries based on his findings. And the world was watching what later became the book The Da Vinci Code. They were watching this intrigue from the death of Degbert II and this hidden organization keeping secret the identity of the Merovingian kings. But Henry Lincoln, um, he had been reading a book. As he, as he researched further, he went into the National Library of France and he found the, some secret documents. They were called the Dossier Secret, the secret dossiers. Secret dossiers. And they were written by another name that Pierre had. Pierre Plantin decided, had his, uh, declared, had his name changed to Philippe Toscan du Plantier. And he wrote this book in, in um, conjunction with Cherise. Well, Henry Lincoln was so impressed with that. Him, along with Richard Lee and Michael Bagent, wrote a book in 1982 called The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. Made a bit of a splash. This book was written as a non-fiction book based on the secrets that they had unearthed. When that came to light, scholars and skeptics started to research their research. The upshot of it was that Pierre Plantard ended up doing a stint at a, His Majesty's service in prison. And uh, this book was debunked because it's non-fiction. It was nonsense because the facts were not facts. The truth was not truth. And I'll put it to you, friends, that much of what we get purported, ha purportedly handed to us as fact is not fact, and much of what we get told as truth is not truth. Enter Dan Brown. Dan Brown is an amazing researcher. And going through some research, he found the story behind this book. The story of the Priory of Sion. The whole hoax. These men were, were jailed for being hoaxers, 
fraudsters trying to wrest the kingship of France to the, for themselves. And when Dan Brown found all of this research that I've just shared with you, Dan Brown thought this is nonsense, is non-fiction. But it's a brilliant story as fiction. And the world today is all aware of Dan Brown's book. The trouble is, Dan Brown in his foreword says that this book is fictional. And do you know how many people in the world today believe that what's written in that book is what the truth is? We're going to just have a look at some of the truth in this book. Dan Brown is a, is a genius. He knew a good story when he saw it. But he didn't try to pass it off as fact, but many people do today. In this book, it claims that Jesus was just a man. He was married to Mary Magdalene. Arat's claim's true. He was married to Mary Magdalene. We had a uh, theologian. I don't mind mentioning her name. It was public knowledge. She put out a public statement. Dame Barbara Thering from Australia, an Australian academic. She bought into this theory and she taught that Jesus came down off the cross. The man Jesus didn't die on the cross. He came down, he married Mag Mary Magdalene and had six children and lived in the Balkans. Are those claims true? Let's, let's see. Jesus' divinity was the result, they tell us, in this book. Dan Brown says, based on the, the Priory of Sion teachings, Jesus' divinity was the result of a vote by the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD. And he said, in the book it says it was a relatively close vote. Let's see what the facts of history tell us. There was only two bishops refused to sign the council documents. They were removed and sent into exile by the emperor. Encyclopedia of Early Christianity, New York, 1997, page, one, uh, 1997, page 812. So the facts of history, 316 bishops signed in favour Two refused to sign. A relatively close vote? I think not. The Da Vinci Code claims the Bible is the product of a man collated by the of men men and the and it was collated by the Roman Emperor Constantine. Let's see what the history tells us. There are eighty six thousand quotations from the New Testament in the early church fathers' writings. 86,000. These Christian leaders lived long before Constantine. Once again, debunked as a myth. The Da Vinci Code is full of historical errors. But Dan Brown, if he was standing here on the stage with me tonight, he would tell you the book's not based on fact. It's a fictional story. It's the readers that have said that it was fact. It's an unreliable source of factual information, an unreliable source of history. We need to go to a reliable source of history. We need to go to a reliable source of history to find out who was Jesus of Nazareth. Some of us have been gathered here for four nights now. Where do we find a reliable source of history? This book. This book is the most reliable source of history we have. Time magazine identified Jesus Christ as the single most powerful figure, not merely of these two millennium, but in all human history. All human history. That was in 1999. He was a real person living in Palestine around 2,000 years ago. That's just a matter of fact. Let's look at some ancient manuscripts, some ancient writings from non-Christian historians. If you want to learn about how good McDonald's is, don't get a McDonald's rep to write a review for you. If you want to find out whether a particular food is good for you, don't get some research done by the people selling that food. If you want to learn how good a, a Skoda car is, get an unbiased view. Don't ask somebody that sells Skodas. If we want to find out about Jesus... A good unbiased source is non-Christian historians. Would you agree with me? Thallus, 52 AD, writes about the death of Jesus. Just decades after. Seropian, 73 AD, talks about the execution of the king of the Jews. And our friend, the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, 
39, uh, 37 to 97. He's already gained credibility in some of these lectures. He says, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds. Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, condemned him to the cross. Josephus was not a Christian. He wrote an accurate record of the history of his time. And the greatest Roman historian, Tacitus, he said, Christos, from whom the name, uh, the name had its origins, he's talking about the way the church there that was spreading into Rome, suffered the extre extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Need I go on? We see that historians refer to this man as a real person. There's no denying that he was a real person. But what sort of a person was he? Archaeology supports the reality of Jesus here in the amphitheatre in Caesarea. They've discovered the, what's called the Pilate Stone. It's written on there, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. They've also discovered recently the ossuary of Caiaphas, the high priest. The writing on it tells us that this was Caiaphas, the high priest at the time of Jesus. Caiaphas is in the gospel narrative. His name is, is recorded there. So Jesus, without question, was a real person living in Nazareth 2,000 years ago. But who was he really? Was he just a, a good man? Was he something akin to an ancient prophet called Jeremiah? Or the Chinese religious leader Confucius? Gautama Buddha, perhaps? Was he one of these good men that had some good teachings, had a lot of wisdom, spoke a few pithy proverbs? Is that who he was? Well, let's see what he claimed to be. Who did he claim to be? And then let's make our assessment on that. In the book of Revelation, we're told that he's dictating it. He's given it to his angel and it's dictated to, to John the Revelator. He says, Behold, I come quickly. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Alpha and Omega are A and Z to us. It's the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So Jesus claims to be the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. At the beginning of Revelation we read, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, and you notice that God is written in capital letters, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So when we compare Revelation 22 and Revelation chapter 1, what do we read? Jesus claimed to be God Almighty. Whoa, let's take a backward step from that. That's a big claim. That's a big claim for a human being, a person walking, breathing, bleeding, eating, to say that they're God Almighty. Don't you agree? Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last Besides me, there is no God. This is back in the Old Testament. Over 600 years before Jesus. Jesus claims to be Jehovah, God Almighty. Huge claim. None of the other holy men in history have ever made that claim. They've never made the claim to be the creator. And... I've been a serious student of this book since I first realized its veracity and validity. And I found that his followers who have written in the New Testament, they identify him as the creator. They all are in agreement that he is Jehovah God. Well, I put it to you, friends, if he claimed that, we are left with only three possibilities. One... He's mad. When he's mad. If I stood up here and said, I just want to inform you that I am Lord God Almighty. You'd be saying, look, just don't let him out until the truck arrives, the van arrives to take him away. I'd be mad to say that. Let's apply the same to Jesus. Or I would be bad. I would be bad because if I said that and knew I wasn't, what would that make me? 
It would make me a liar. So if Jesus wasn't God, but believed he was, then he's mad. If he said he was God, but knew he wasn't, he would be a liar, which would make him bad. There's only one third option. We can't serve a person that's mad or bad. The third option that he is actually God. He is actually who he said he was. Let's check that theory. Let's check whether he was God or not. Let's look for some evidence. Let's look for some evidence to back up his claim. And let's act as detectives today. Let's just pretend we're trying to solve a cold case. Let's just weigh up the evidence. And let's not have a, a pre-prescribed conclusion to our search. Let's be open to the fact that we might find that this man is mad. We might find that this man is bad because he's a liar. Or we may find that he is actually God. The Dead Sea Scrolls, from, uh, discovered in 1947 is full of ancient predictions with a proven track record. We saw that. We've seen that the book of Daniel has given us some amazing predictions that have all come true, outlining the history of the world. We saw Jesus last night made predictions that have all come true. That's not enough, the fact that he could predict the future, because Daniel did it as well. Other prophets have predicted the future, claiming that they're doing it through the power of God. The fact that Jesus made some predictions that came right does not make him God. But the, the facts of his life being predicted as what we're going to study, not what he said, but what was said about him, his birth and his life and his death were all written beforehand. The Old Testament contains about 300 messianic prophecies. How many did I say? 300 messianic prophecies. These are prophecies that we look back at, we look at now and say, man, that was him. He is the one that it was talking about. The book of Matthew, if you would care to study a Bible, if you pick up a book of Matthew and go through the Gospel of Matthew, you will find continually Matthew is proving the fulfillment of this prophecy and that prophecy, more than any of the other writers, he says, that it might be fulfilled that was written of by the prophet, etc., etc. 300 messianic prophecies. Don't let that number escape you. Dr. Peter Stoner, rather an unfortunate name to have in the colloquial terminology of the current world, isn't it? But Peter Stoner, he was the Professor Emeritus of Astronomy and Mathematics at Pasadena University in the United States of America. In 1963, he did a mathematical equation. And he said the chance of fulfilling, what number do we see here? Eight. I tell you, friends, when I went to school, mathematics wasn't my favourite subject. I was often hiding during mathematics. And in the fifth form, I didn't even have to do it. I was excluded from doing maths in my fifth form year. But even me with my limited mathematics can tell you that 8 is a much smaller figure than 300. 8 prophecies. The chances of filling just 8 in one man is that figure there. 1 to the power of a pair of a lot of zeros. That's a big number. My mathematics goes as far as 308, doesn't go as far as that number. In fact, none of our mathematics goes as big as that. We can't even comprehend that number. To try and comprehend it, Peter Stoner did this exercise. He worked out how many coins it would take. So if we took 10 cent pieces and we laid them over the entire nation of Australia, and Australia is big. It's almost as big as that number. Australia is a huge continent. If we laid those 10 cent coins two inches deep across the entire land mass of, of Australia and we just painted one red, just one red, and we said to somebody, you need to walk out there with your eyes closed, reach down and pick out one of those coins. 
And if you get the red one, you win the prize. It's an impossibility, isn't it? The chances of selecting it are the same as eight prophecies fulfilled in one person's life. And how many were there, friends? 300. What would that number be? It's infinity. It's impossible. It's a totally impossible number. The prophecies reveal to us that Jesus is God. Let's have a look at just some of the prophecies toward the end of his life. Number one, his betrayal by a friend. We read this in the book of Psalms. Even my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And we know that Judas, sitting at the table with Jesus on his last night, went out and betrayed him. Jesus said, I know whom I have chosen, and that, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Gospel of John 13 verse 18. The amount of money he was betrayed for. This is a staggering prophecy. Zechariah said, Thus says the Lord, they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. How did they know? How could Zechariah have possibly known the price of a slave centuries later? How could he have known the price of a slave almost half a millennia later? What's the price of bread going to be in the year 2001? Uh, 2021, sorry. 2021. What's the price of bread going to be in 2021? What's the price of fuel going to be tomorrow? Imagine trying to predict the price of bread or fuel or anything else 500 years in the future. Totally impossible. But the scripture tells us. And how did the Bible know silver would be a currency? Because it hasn't always been. Time of Zechariah, it wasn't currency, but in the time of Christ it was. How could the Bible know? How could the writer know? Where the, where the money brought and how it would be spent is also identified in the scripture, 450 years before Christ. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord, which is the temple of the potter. Here, this is... Some remnants of the ancient temple. And in the picture on the right, we see the stalls. This is the excavations down to the time of Christ. This is the, the place where the people were buying and selling stock. They were trading coins for people to offer as a temple tax. It was in this area, the scriptures tell us, Jesus went in and drove them out, the money changes out. These, are the, these steps are from the time of Christ. And we know that Jesus would have ascended these steps. So would have Judas, side by side. But Judas took the coins up that step into the temple. And in the scripture tells us, the New Testament tells us, then, this is a narrative on history, this isn't a prophecy, this is explaining what happened. Then he, Judas, threw down the pieces of silver in the temple. 450 years before the prophecy was, they would be thrown in the temple. They were thrown in the temple and he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests consulted together and bought with them the potter's field. Friends, this isn't myth and legend. This isn't a story that's being made up. Dan Brown couldn't make up this story. Pierre Plantard couldn't make up this story. Because the story has got prophecies in it that are fulfilled. The prophecy is precise. Who it would betray him, the amount of his betrayal, where the money brought would be, would be taken and how the money would be spent. That's enough to tell me that Jesus, this figure identified in prophecy, is actually God. But if that's not enough for you, I want to look at some other prophecies that, would, that identify him. The method of torture that he would suffer. This was written, you notice the date here? 700 years before. Seven centuries before. Let's just put that in our modern context, shall we? 
What was happening in the world in the year 1318? Is anybody aware of what was going on in the world back then? That's just ancient history to us, isn't it? That's putting it in context. This is how long before this was written. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard and I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Written by the prophet Isaiah. Who is Isaiah talking about? Thus says the Lord Jehovah. That same text is preceded by saying, Thus says the Lord Jehovah, I gave my back. Whose back? The Lord God Jehovah's back. In the um, movie, The Passion of the Christ, there's a, I haven't seen the movie, but I'm told that there's a very graphic illustration of Jesus being whipped. They called it scourging. The Roman scourging was a cat of nine tails where the leather throngs had bits of glass and lead and, and stone and shell embedded in them and they would hit you on the back and then rip it across your back and it would just open the flesh up. Jesus had that happen to him 78 times. Normally it was 39. He was scourged twice. So he would have just ripped open. The man that played Christ in the Passion of the Christ, as he was being whipped, had a piece of plywood over his back. And as they were whipping him, and with all the cinematography and the special effects, they can make it look like he's taking the beating. During that beating, one of those, just one thong, missed the board and went round the corner. He had 14 stitches. Could you imagine how brutal that was? Jesus, I put it to you, is Jehovah, God in human flesh. The method of his death, oh, sorry, it was written a thousand years before. Look at that figure, a thousand years before. We're going back to, we're going back to the year 1018. What was happening in 1018? Only thing I know that happened in that era was King Harold got shot in the eye with an arrow at the Battle of Hastings in 1066 a few years later. I never understood what that was about when I was at school, but it's one thing of history I seem to have remembered. But a thousand years before, it says, they pierced my hands and my feet. Talking about crucifixion, he was pierced, nailed to a cross. Archaeologists have discovered this bone in Jerusalem. This is a bone, an ankle bone of a person who had been crucified, and the ages have caused the bone and the, and the spike to just to have become one and become petrified. The prophet, the psalmist, a thousand years before, said that he would be crucified. How did he know that? Crucifixion was only practiced from generally from 150 to 320. 150 BC to 320 AD by the Romans. The basics were invented by the Assyrians and the Romans used it as a form of torture. How could they have ever known that that would be a type of torture in the future, a type of execution? They didn't. There's the prophecy of the time of his ministry. This is very special. If there's only one prophecy I want to share with you tonight, it's this one, because this is the one that proves beyond all reasonable doubt that Jesus is who he said he was. And that's why this is the forbidden prophecy. This is the cursed prophecy. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah or Christ. That's the same word. I'll show you, show you the different uh, languages where it, it means the same, in Hebrew, Greek, and English. He claimed to be the Messiah or Christ. He cla claimed to be God. The high priest said to him, swear by oath to the living God, are you the Christ? Jesus said nothing during his trial, but when asked, are you actually the Christ? Jesus said to him, it is as you have said. He could not remain silent when his identity was challenged. He said, yes, I am the Christ, in other words. The high priest was so incensed with that, he tore his robes and said, this man speaks blasphemy. Blasphemy is claiming to be God. 
So Jesus is either a blasphemer or he is God. Was Jesus a Messiah or Christ and therefore God? Well, the book of Daniel chapter 9 has this phenomenal prophecy that we will give you in this series all the backstory to it, all of the undergirding of this prophecy. But for just for tonight's sake, suffice it to say, we're just going to share the point that deals with Jesus. You do not want to miss this. This is absolutely astounding, studying the story behind this prophecy. Daniel chapter 9. Jerusalem had been in ruins for 70 years after the overthrow by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Remember our friend Nebuchadnezzar? And Jeremiah the prophet, uh, Daniel the prophet was reading the books of Jeremiah. So Daniel, a captive in Babylon, was reading the books of Jeremiah. And he's praying because he read in that book three times the, that book prophesied that the people of Israel would be captive in Babylon. That's specific to prophecy. It says they will be in Babylon for 70 years. Daniel, now an old man, goes, it's 70 years. So he starts praying for the, their deliverance. And an angel called Gabriel appears to him. And he informs Daniel when the Messiah or the Christ will come. These are his words. He said, 70 weeks are determined. That word determined means cut off or severed. In Hebrew, the word is chatak, meaning to cut off from something bigger. And we'll see what the something bigger is in a later session. But it's, it's cut off from a bigger portion of time. But there's 70 weeks to determine for you, uh, your people, and for your holy city. 70 weeks for Israel and Jerusalem. Know therefore and understand, it says, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So we've got a beginning point. You can't have a period of time just floating around somewhere in, in space, just wandering around. It's got to be anchored by a beginning point and an end point. So we've got a beginning point, the command to restore Jerusalem. That's going to be 69 weeks, 7 weeks and 62 weeks. You all tracking with me? So there's a 70 week period, determined, cut, cut off for the people of Israel, for Daniel's people. And then there's this command to restore Jerusalem and there's going to be 69 weeks. We've got an interesting week at the end we will discuss. And Messiah, Messiah or the Christ comes at that time. What's the beginning point? What date is that? It's, Ezra tells us in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, he was one of the Persian kings who realized that they, were, they had been given the role of restoring and rebuilding Jerusalem, building the temple, building the city. He was a subsequent king to Cyrus and Darius. He said, I issue a decree. That date of this, the decree, the seventh year of Artaxerxes, was the year... Sorry, it was 457 BC. If we go to Egypt now, go to the, uh, the Nile River, and in the middle of the Nile River, there's this, this amazing island called the Elephantine Island. On this island, close to Aswan, they've excavated these Jew Jewish mercenary houses. These were mercenaries, these were Jewish soldiers who were fighting for the Persians, for the Medes and the Persians. And if they're anything like the Israeli soldiers today, this would have been an elite force because they're good fighters. When they excavated this, they found these Aramaic double-dated documents that show 100% that that date of Daniel's time prophecy was 457 BC. So from... 457 BC to Messiah or the Christ is a period of 69 weeks or 69 times 7. My maths is really good when I can read it on the screen. That's 483. So 69 weeks times 7 days per week, 483 prophetic days. There is a Bible principle that is taught and upheld by every Christian denomination. It's a, it's a basic biblical principle that a day in prophecy stands for one literal year. We find that in Ezekiel 4, 6. 
I have laid on you a day for each year. Numbers 14.34. After the children of Israel had spent 40 days searching out the wilderness, God says, I will give you one day for a year. And each day for a year, they spent 40 years wandering around. and the, They'd been in the promised land, sorry. So they'd been 40 years, uh, 40 days. They'd been 40 days searching out the promised land. When the spies came back and they rejected God's ability to get them in there, he said, I'm going to give you a day for a year. And he said, each day that you were there, 40 days, you're going to spend one year in the wilderness. And they spent 40 years in the wilderness. You've all heard of the 40 years in the wilderness? That's because of this day for a year principle. So 483 prophetic days equals 483 literal years. So if we start at 457 BC, we add 483 years, what date does that give us? It gives us the year 27 AD. So Messiah, Messiah or the Christ comes in 27 AD. What happened in 27 AD? I want to read a scripture text. I'm going to read a wee bit more than what's on the screen to you. In Luke chapter 3, we read now, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... I'm going to read the three dots to you. I'm going to interpret some ancient, ancient language here. It's, it's dot language. I'm going to interpret that for you into modern English. The three dot language. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother tetrarch of Icharia, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. The word of God came unto John in the wilderness. I'm not sure, but I get the inkling that all of those people being identified as ruling in all those different areas at that time was given to us so we could pinpoint the date. Or is that just my suspicious mind? You do not find another date from beginning end to the end of the Bible, so identified as that date. It's as if God wants us to be able to identify it by crossing over all of the rulers, both Roman and Jewish. And in that time, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven saying, which said, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Fifteenth year of Tiberius was 27 AD. And Jesus became the anointed one. Because the word Messiah and the word Christ are the same word. Masiak in Hebrew is Messiah, or Christos in Greek means Christ. That's exactly the same word. That's what Christ means. Jesus Christ means Jesus, the anointed one. When was Jesus anointed? Acts 10.38. Peter says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Where? At the Jordan River in AD 27. Jesus appears, the Messiah appears, Christ appears, the anointed one appears. When? AD 27. We're going to look at the rest of this prophecy and, and it's just absolutely staggering how it pinpoints that this man was the appointed Messiah. After that time, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. If I was to say to you, the time is fulfilled, do I mean a time is just beginning or a time has just been completed? Clearly, it means a time has been completed. And the time that has been completed is the... the 69 weeks of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Jesus is the Messiah. He's God in human flesh. Sir Isaac Newton says that that date, that prophecy, identifying the Messiah is the foundation stone of the Christian religion. Chapter, chapter 9 of Daniel is where we find the, the forbidden prophecy. Because there is an enemy. If God exists, there is an, en an enemy that exists. And he does not want any of us to know that Jesus is who he said he was. 
He would have people think that he was a liar or that he was a madman. And this prophecy is the one nail in that lies coffin. So this prophecy has been hidden from view from people. You can read the reference at the bottom there. Out of the Mishnah, it says, May the spirits of those who attempt to calculate the final time of Mashiach's coming expire. The Jews have put a curse on that prophecy. Nobody's allowed to, to interpret it. Sadly, many in Christian churches today are discouraged from reading the Bible. The biggest denomination discourages their people from even reading the Bible, so then they won't read the prophecy, will they? Muslims don't read it. Jews are forbidden from reading this prophecy. But what about those of us who call ourselves Protestants? We have the prophecy, don't we? Everybody can go to Daniel 9 and read it. One of the saddest things I've found since I've been a Christian is the amazing amount of effort that's being put into misconstruing that prophecy and all the different views that there are about it. There's a prophecy of his resurrection. You will not leave my soul in Sheol, the grave, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. Also written a thousand years before. Isaiah says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Who's the Holy One that won't see corruption? It's God. Christ is God. Christ's resurrection te testifies that he was more than just a human being. I've been there, and friends, it is simply an empty tomb. And somebody has written inside that tomb, he's alive, he's not here. Jesus said, I lay down my life and I have power to take it again. Based on that little bit of evidence of just eight prophecies. I can share the 300 if you like, if we want to stay here for a couple of <laughs> full days and nights to go through the 300 prophecies. But I believe on the evidence of the ones we've shared, Jesus is Jehovah. He is God in human flesh. The Old Testament prophecies reveal Jesus is God. So the big question is, so what? That Jesus is God. Book of Revelation says, I'm the first, the last, the Almighty. I'm he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And amen. And I have the keys of what? I have the keys of Hades. What does Hades mean? It's simply a word that means in Greek, the grave and of death. He can offer eternal life because he's conquered the grave. He came and he conquered the grave, friends. Jesus said to Martha, as she was mourning the loss of her brother, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John says, God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son, he who has the Son has, like he who is not the Son has not, the, has not life. So what that Jesus is God, it means that we are absolutely never alone. Nothing can separate us, Paul writes, from the love of God. He had promised us to be with us always. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Is that all? So what? Jesus is God. I tell you, friends, it means a lot if Jesus is God because our past can be forgiven. I made a mention of my past last night. I want to praise God that I'm forgiven of the things that I've done. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to a, a lame man, take up your bed and walk. He gives us power to live life at the very best as well. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Paul, a man who hated Jesus, hated Christians, murdered many of them, would later write, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things how? Because that man is actually Jehovah God, that is what he's saying. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Power to break the chains of guilt, the shackles of immorality, bondage to materialism, slavery to alcohol and drugs, the shackles of anger and, vi anger and violence are all broken because that man is who he says he is.
Don't take my word for it. Take the word of billions who've experienced that power in this world and are experiencing it to this very day. A power that's foreign to, it's, it's alien to who we are. It's external to us. But when we avail ourselves of it, those things that were too hard for us lose their hold. I'm a testimony to that. We have hope, peace, and a life with power. And on that note, I rest my case. I believe the evidence shows us that Jesus is who he claimed he was. Not a liar, not a madman, but very clearly the third option, he was God. Jehovah God Almighty. So friends, we have realised tonight that we're in the middle of a battle. In fact, we are the battleground. Well, the battle has moved through the ages, through the eons of time that we've been alive, and we're going to take you to Egypt in our next presentation. And we're going to look at the topic, life after life. Is there life after death? What does the Bible say about it? And how can we be sure of attaining it? Come with me to Egypt next week and learn some amazing insights into the age-old perplexing problem, what happens when we die.